Bless us now, Lord, in Jesus' name, as we preach, teach the word of God today. Save the soul that's near as hell. Encourage the believer. Give us strength to do that which is lawful, holy, and right. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Spirit-led victory. Spirit. Just come on in and be seated. Allow me to begin by saying that Romans 8 and 1 is an awesome passage of scripture that brings joy to the heart of the believer whether Romans 8 and 1 is read uh, in its contextual setting or just uh, standing alone. It's just good news. It can, like other passages, lift one from the valley of despair and defeat to the heights of triumphant victory and joy. Let's read it again and look at the wonderfulness of this passage. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But let me say this, as powerful as this passage is, it is even ever more powerful when it is looked at and considered in its contextual setting. For if you look at this passage in its contextual setting, you will see that this passage is a, it's not a doxology. It's not a, it's not a praise, although to give you joy. It's not a psalm, although to lift your spirit. It is a strategy. It is strategic. It unlocks the dilemma that all believers contend with. The answer to our greatest war, to winning our greatest battles are contained in Romans 8. And verse 1, when studied in its contextual setting, you will see that Romans 8 and 1 is no meaningless platitude. Yes, it is not a feel-good passage of Scripture. It is one of the most strategic passages that deals with where we are on this earth while we live in this present time. Hence it says, there is therefore now. Remember I told you to say now. There, there is something to now. Now opposed to then. Now opposed to someday. Now. Everybody shout, now. This passage holds the key to gaining victory over our greatest opponent. Our greatest opponent is not the devil. Our greatest opponent, those of you who are of color, is not Someone whose color is different from yours. It's not the white man. And for those of you who are Caucasian, your greatest opponent is not people of color. Your greatest opponent is not that person over there sitting across the, in the church who you are silly enough to live in your head rent free. You're, you're the fool. There's something wrong with you if you give somebody that. I, I, I get vexed every time I look at it. Something's wrong with you. When are you going to grow and develop? I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm just not going to live like that. I got to keep my eyes on 
so and so, they, if they enter the room, whatever, I got to make sure of that church, I got to see what they're doing. No, no, no. Jesus will help me. Jesus alone. The Lord knows. Are you listening to me? Your greatest opponent, my greatest opponent, the source of my greatest opposition is myself. Me, Patrick Wooden, is Patrick Wooden's greatest opponent. Patrick Wooden is diametrically opposed to Pastor Bishop Born Again Patrick Wooden. If Patrick Wooden has his way, he will cause Bishop Wooden to self destruct. I feel like preaching. Our greatest opponent is ourselves. Our greatest opponent is the person that we listen to the most. Our greatest opponent is also our greatest companion. Our greatest opponent is that individual who's ever Present with us. When you go to bed, he's there. Wake up first thing in the morning, he's there. Driving down the road, riding right there with you. In the shower, there. When on your knees praying, will tap you on the shoulder. Hello? You ever been praying, you're talking to the Lord, and a carnal thought come to your mind? Hello? Romans 8 and 1, in context, God bless the Haynes. I love Brother Willie Haynes. He married Sister Princess, and they are doing a tremendous job a beautiful couple, and they're out there in California, San Francisco, on the left coast. But they're living holy. Amen. Keep up the good work. Take care of, my, take care of our spiritual daughter now. Say amen. All right, because she loved sanctification before she married you. And she's still sanctified. Is that right, princess? All right, then. Let's, let's take a look. Uh, at this great passage of scripture in its contextual setting. During our AIM conference, Chairman Willie Bamberg, chairman of our AIM conference, pastor of Judah Sanctuary, Church of God in Christ, Portsmouth, Virginia, did a tremendous job exegeting Romans 7, 14 and down. While he was dealing with it, I said, Lord, let him leave something for me. In Romans 7, <clears throat> instead of looking at 14 and down, let's, 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 let's look at verse 12 and 13 first. Because see, Paul makes a powerful declaration. He says this about the law. It's so for the law, and the law he's speaking of here is, is, is the Old Testament teachings, the Torah, the law, the law, the law, and the prophets, okay? The writings of Moses, the standards of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, uh, the law reflects, as I said earlier, the righteous standards of God. Hallelujah. The God of the Bible is a holy God. He's the true God and an everlasting king. Holy, holy. His standards are high. And the law reflected his standards. Says, 
Wherefore the law is, number one, holy. And the commandment is holy. Not only is it holy, but it is also just. And it is good. So he asks a question concerning the law. And uh, he says, was then that which is good? The law. God's righteous standards. Made death unto me. Was then that which is good become death to me? Did, it, did, did the effect of these lofty standards and these lofty standards being made known to me and my inability to live up to them, did, did they then uh, become a death sentence to me? He says, he answers. As even at, no matter how high those standards are, his answer was no. That's what God forbid means. No, you see it? But sin, look at this, but sin that it might appear sin. No, it wasn't a death sentence to me. Uh, that is, it, did, it didn't cause death in me, but the word revealed that it was sin, not the righteous standards of God that was killing me. This is why it's so important, preachers, to preach the standards. Because what the standards reveal is the, the, is, the, the standard is not what's killing you. It's sin. That's killing. Sin will kill you whether you find out that it's killing you or not. Some of us were stunned to find out that we were eating all the wrong things. So I can't understand why. I can't lose weight. I, every night before I go to bed, I eat something light. I just eat fruit. I, I eat fruit. Praise God. One of the biggest errors you can make. Because all the fruit is full of sugar. After you eat it, the sugar is going to break down and be stored, you know, become starch and be stored as fat. So you, you didn't know that it was detrimental to you in terms of wanting to lose weight, but it didn't mean that it wasn't blocking you. You just, you just didn't know what the problem was. See, uh, sin was killing you before the law came and told you that it was sin. I've been eating this food. Got, I got high blood pressure. I've been eating this food, and it's good because, look at it. It's low fat. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, no fat in it. Uh, low carbohydrates. Praise God. It's, it's the right thing. But then the sodium is so high. Ooh, look at that sodium. Uh, sodium. Sodium so high. Uh, just, they really lit that, look, sodium too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. It's killing you. It, it's, it's, it's causing your blood pressure to spike. But you did it in ignorance. You shouldn't get mad because they finally put it on the label. Because see, even when it wasn't on the label, it was still working against you. So the problem wasn't the law. The law exposed the sin. That's what he's saying here. It was sin that was working death in me by that which is good. That, here's what the law did. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. That is, that the law, the standards showed just how awful sin is. Do you like that preaching, this kind of preaching? He says, uh, for, which literally is, because we know that the law is spiritual. Now, why did Paul here call the law spiritual? He called the law spiritual because this was his way of saying, and you're not going to like this, that the law is not the problem. 
See, we're in a day now where the problem now are standards. That's the problem. Standards. They, they accuse people who have standards of being judgmental. These judgmental, hypocrite Christians with their standards. See, the problem is no longer uh, perversion. It's those of us who have a standard that perversion is wrong. Oh, it, nothing wrong with abortion. Nothing at all. It, 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 there's nothing at all wrong with killing an innocent, unborn baby in the womb. Who's wrong are the people who dare go out and protest and try to save the baby. That's the problem. Paul starts out by saying, uh-huh. I'll tell you something about the law. Praise the Lord. The law is spiritual. And let me say this. Let me say this. B bear with me just for a few minutes. Uh, you, you, you knew you weren't going to get a sermon at just because I preached Friday night, you know. I, 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 I come to work this morning. Say amen. Let me establish a few things about Romans 7, 14 through 25. First of all, I want you all to know, because there's a lot of the, the discussion because when you start talking about sinning and all that, well, as to who was Paul talking about, Paul was talking about himself. He was talking about himself, and, and in, from, from, in, in Romans 7, uh, 7 through 25, Paul uses the first person singular. The first person singular appears in Romans 7, 7 through 25, 46 times. So he's talking about himself. Amen. And Paul was speaking of himself not as a sinner. Some have said when Paul wrote this, he was talking about the way he were, was before he got saved. Not true. Paul was speaking of himself as a believer. The fact, how do you know? The fact that he had a struggle tells you he, he was saved. Sinners don't struggle with sin. Sinners, you know, the sinners ain't talking about no good that I would, I do not. Evil that's in me, I do. I hate what I'm doing. Oh, no, no. The sinners be saying, let me have it. Give me another drink. Praise the Lord. The man before he got saved had no problem with fornication. Only problem he had was when he didn't get the chance to commit fornication. Go home that night. <laughs> Almost had her. Before you get saved, you don't struggle with drinking. If you're drunk, you, you struggle with being sober. People, people have been in the hospital with cirrhosis of the liver, telling their friends, slip me in a sip. Can't breathe, trying to, if I could just have another smoke. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the, the struggles that he talks about reveals that he was indeed uh, uh, not only a believer, but a mature believer. See, only mature Christians recognize this level of battle. The person Paul describes hates sin. Only a mature, experienced believer would be concerned with such struggles. The immature believer, it doesn't even cross their mind. All they want is their stuff. All they want is the next level. All they're believing God for is a new car, a raise in pay. Praise the Lord. The nominal Christian, the carnal believer, don't care anything about struggling with no sin in them. Praise the Lord. This text describes the inner conflict that the believer has with himself. One part pulling him one way. I'm going to help you. And then the other part of him pulling him another. And the conflict that we all face as believers is an intense conflict. And no one is exempt from this conflict. Amen. Galatians 5 and 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, 
word spirit that is capitalized. Walk in the Holy Ghost. And, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For, that is, because the flesh, that unredeemed part of all of us that never gets saved. That's what the flesh is. See, when the Lord saves you, we say the Lord saved our soul. That's not, incor that's not incorrect, but most specifically, what gets born again is your spirit. But the body that your spirit, our spirit lives in, within this body, within this human body, lies the principle of fallenness. It is what Adam brought into the world. It is our fallen humanity. That's that part of us that doesn't get saved. Now I'm revealing to you why you have that other voice and those other thoughts. Holy Spirit says, pray now. There's another voice that speaks just as fast. Pray later. Holy Ghost says, church time. There's another voice that says, but you're tired. Holy Ghost says, uh, but she's not your wife. That other voice says, but she's wonderful. All believe. Contend with this. It may not, your contention may not be of a sexual nature. Sometimes it is of a financial nature. Sometimes it is of a relational nature. Not everybody struggles with uh, fornication. Some people struggle with jealousies, envy, hatred, hatred, strife. Some of us, uh, time and circumstance have prevented us from being able to participate in some of the struggles physically. Sometimes you just grow out the age group. Can't do it no more. But you still think about it. I want to reveal the struggle. What is it in you that resents the church? Resents the preacher? Even though you know you're saved. But you have a problem with this. That's the flesh. See. Uh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these. There's no middle ground. These are contrary. One's north, the other south. One's east, the other west. They, they are contrary one to another. And this is the intense battle and struggle that goes on in every believer. Then the Bible says they're contrary one to, a, to another uh, uh, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Other words, sometimes the, when the Holy Ghost wins out, you do what the Holy Ghost would have you to do. When that other part of you wins out, you do what it would have you to do. Where you are spiritually depends on, determines which part wins the most. This is why Bible study Prayer, fasting, seeking the Lord, coming to church, participating in church. All these things weigh in so heavily because they strengthen your born again spirit. You don't have to do anything to strengthen that, weak, that, that wicked part of you. That wicked part of us is just like weeds. High in the world. You know, or you got, to, you got to put seeds down and tracks down to get grass to grow. But the weeds will grow up through the concrete. I mean, no, no fertilization, no sprinkler system, no help, no water, and the weed still comes up. Yes, this is the battle. You have to kill them weeds. <laughs> this particular passage, Romans 7, 7 through 25, praise the Lord. Uh, it describes the sad experience or better the distance between what we know to do and what we actually do. 
The goal is to narrow that distance. The goal, sanctif the sanctification process narrows the distance. The distance between what we know and what we walk out. The closer we get to what we know, the more sanctified we are. Glory to God. You don't want a super highway between what you know to do and what you're actually doing. The goal is to let it go from a four lane to a two lane, from a two lane to a one lane, from a one lane to a path to becoming the same. See, we, that is righteousness imparted. That is sanctification declared through the blood of Jesus. But then there is practical sanctification. There is that which must be walked out. That has to be lived. Are you with me today? Praise the Lord. One more thing I want to say is that Romans chapter 7 verse 25 is the ultimate. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said unto his disciples, sit ye here while I go yonder to pray. He left the nine and he took with him Peter, James, and John, Zebedee's boys. And when he took them with him, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, right before their eyes, Brother Sawyer, changed. He went into deep, 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 deep depression. He went from being the optimistic, stalwart, devil casting out, solution to every dilemma, savior of the world, to someone whose attitude and disposition was that of someone who was almost suicidal. The Bible says right before eyes and began to be sorrowful and very, it doesn't, it doesn't say heavy, very heavy. Jesus, he let, he couldn't let everybody see him like that. See, you can't do that in front of everybody. He let Peter, James, and John see him. I'm going I'm to preach fast. And can you, can you imagine? He's gone from, remember on the Mount of Transfiguration in chapter 17, he shined like the sun. Yes. We see him here at his lowest place. This, this was lower, lower than Calvary. Yes, this, he's lower here than he was hanging on the cross. Mm -hmm. For on the cross, he was so beautiful that the natural sun went out. Because two suns couldn't shine at the same time. Good God Almighty, and he declared to tell us how it is finished. But here, here, not only is our Lord heavy, but he's very heavy. Then said unto them, he didn't lie to them. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. He didn't say this with glee. He didn't say this with a tune. He was at his lowest place. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even, even unto death. And then he says to them, hey, I can hear his voice. It's not loud. It's not loud. Not here. Tarry you here and watch with me. I need y'all to watch. Just watch. I haven't needed you since I met you. When we were asleep, you woke me up. I told the storm, peace be still. When they needed food, I said, what do you have? So they said, a lad brought his lunch. All right, watch me, bless it. When Lazarus died, what did I do? I went and raised him from the dead. Hadn't needed you. But I need you this time. Watch with me. Praise the Lord. Tarry here. And just watch with me. 
And after he told him that, the Bible says, and he went a little further. And in and, and, and upper room, those who were screaming, it, didn't, it doesn't say that he kneeled down. He went a little further and he fell. The Bible says, King James says, fell. Jesus literally collapsed. He went as far as he could go and uh, collapsed. Jesus. And all he asked of them was just watch with me. I'm going to be right over here. You just watch. He collapses. And when he fell, he did not brace his fall. He did not kneel down. He did not bow down. This is probably the first bruise of the crucifixion. He fell on his face. Would it hurt you to fall on your face? But do you think your face would get bruised if you collapsed and, 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 and there was nothing to catch your fall? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wasn't, praise the Lord, in the bedroom and fell on a mattress. He fell on the ground. He collapsed. For your sins and mine. And uh, prayed and said, Oh, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Pray. Then the Bible says, Then, and, and he cometh, to his disciples, the special ones, the ones who have seen things no one else has seen, his inner circle, the ones who were with him if no one else would be with him, the ones who were more loyal to him than his mother was. And at this point, none of his immediate family, none of his brothers nor sisters had become believers. His closest Three companions on earth who knew how low he was because he told them. He showed them and he collapsed and he prayed and he goes back to find them and he finds them asleep. And he said to Peter, to whom he had already given the keys of the kingdom, upon this rock I will build my church. Flesh and blood, God bless you, sir. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father, Brother Hurst, who is in heaven. He says to him, what? You see the frustration? What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray ah, that you enter not into temptation. Then the Lord acknowledged, Romans 7, 7 through 14, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 43, the second clause tells us that there was just tired for their eyes were heavy. See, we got to strengthen our spirit, man. Because the flesh is weak. The flesh will cause us to, to sleep more than we pray and to wander in our minds more than we watch. When we should be watching, we're wondering. And when we should be praying, we're sleeping. That's what the flesh will do to you. Then when a, when a battle really breaks out, you don't have the power. Can't fight. Can't withstand. You find yourself giving in to the flesh. Ah, uh, I'm preaching too long. I, but, but you, I, but I, I, I got to, I got to. He says here, Romans. Let's go back to Romans for a minute. So, oh my God, he's going back to Romans. We don't want to do that, but we got to. He said, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. That is. The law is not the problem. I'm the problem. It's not the righteous standards of God. It's not that we have church too long. It's not that we shout too much. Oh, no, it's, not, it's, not, it's none of those things. It's us. It's us. Oh, they believe in 
uh, that we're the tradition of church. It's not that we're traditional. It's that you are trying to have church that doesn't resemble church. It's that you have, you have fallen out with the Bible. You have fallen out with scripture. And, 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 and you, the, the society has moved. Nothing wrong with us because we believe a man shouldn't marry a man. It's not us. It's not the word. It's those who don't want to do right. It's not wrong when a, somebody who is experienced in the Lord that says to you in a nice, polite, private way, baby, you, you might want to let that skirt be a little bit longer. And, and you might want to let it be a little bit looser because it's hugging you just a little bit too tight. There you go. She wasn't wrong for trying to help you. Bible does speak of modest apparel. She's not wrong for trying to see through some lenses that you apparently can't see through. Or perhaps you do see through them and that's what you want. That's, you, you're trying to project yourself. <laughs> perhaps that's what it is. It's, 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 it's not wrong if the preacher call you in in private and say, hey brother, listen man, you, you're a little effeminate now. What's going on with that? You know, let me talk to you. Are you all right? You, you need some help in that area? I can't believe he said, I said it in private. Said it in private. Come on, come on, brother. You know, the pants are too tight. Come on, man. Nothing wrong with that. But you see, it, when, when the problem is us, but what we try to do is switch this thing and make the problem the standard. Oh, yeah, I stopped, I stopped going to the upper room because Bishop Wood said something about Obama. Yes, he was wrong to decorate the White House in homosexual colors. Yes, he was wrong to declare that same-sex marriage is the direction we should go in. He was wrong to give record money to Planned Parenthood. He was wrong to, to cut the historical black college fund by some 80-something million dollars. He was wrong to do that. Now, if you go where you want to go. But he was wrong. And I was not wrong to, to call wrong wrong. Well, the problem is not me. The problem is you. Paul said, it's not, it's not, it's not the law. It's not the law. The problem is not the word. It's me. I'm Connor. Soul under sin. Can I, can I preach for a minute here? He said, I'm carnal, soul under sin. And that is, here he's speaking of his uh, unredeemed humanness. His, his unredeemed humanness, he likens it to a slave that has no choice. He says, In my earthly, earthly bound, mortal state, my human condition, this craving that's in me, so I need to, before I can win, I need to establish, first of all, who's right and who's wrong. God's word is right. And anybody and anything that disagrees with God's word, they're wrong. Let's get that, let's establish that first. The law is spiritual. We're the carnal ones. Can I, I feel something. I feel the Holy Ghost in it. He says, praise the Lord. He says, well, for that, which he says here, I'm soul in sin. For that which I do, I allow not. And for what I would do, I, for that that I would do, I do not. But what I hate, that I do. That which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, tell you right there, you had to be saved to hate it. What I hate, what I hate, dealing with being soul under sin. I find myself doing. If 
and then I do that which I would not, I consent then that the law, praise the Lord, I consent unto the law that it is good. good. This is what we got to get there first. The Bible is right. I ain't never seen anything like with the black community now. So many black folk. Well, you know, I have some problem with the Bible. Man, I just, maybe I just want to hit somebody. What do you mean you have a problem with the Bible? Well, you know, I, they, they tell me that there are some inconsistencies and there are some, there, there, there are some problems with it. You, oh, you're talking about the book that brought us out. You, 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 you're talking about the God of your mother, father, God of our forefathers, the God who brought us out. You're talking about the one. You're talking about the one true religion. Since when have you had a, Bible, a problem with the Bible? I'll tell you when you developed the problem with the Bible. When you found out that the Bible spoke against, you putting them tattoos all over you. You developed the problem with the Bible when the Bible says something against smoking marijuana, putting that wicked stuff in you. You developed the problem with the Bible when you get, got old enough to start feeling yourself and you want to have sex and you want to do things that you, that you didn't want to do when you were just a little tyke. Now there are cravings and things but the Bible speaks against those things so now all of a sudden instead of you dealing with your cravings you develop a problem with the Bible it's not the Bible it's not the word of God the Bible is the reason the basic reason that America is blessed the way that she is the Judeo-Christian concept made Western civilization possible. This is why the standard of America, oh my God, our poor people are the richest poor people in the world. Praise the Lord. Everybody who was born in America won life's lottery. But what made us great was the Judeo-Christian concept in short the Bible, now this nation marches in the streets and, and protests against the Bible. I like, this is why I know Paul is mature. So I don't need, need to get mad if you know you were speaking. The man pulled you. Now you know you were speaking. That's right, that's right. Now I'm, I'm an expert. Know you were speaking. Why are you going to put up a fight? Well, you didn't get them other folk. No, no. Uh -huh. got you. That's right. So if you, if you know you are, you were, how about just get the, get the license and registration, be as nice as you can, make it a short visit, because, you know, maybe he'll give you a break, maybe he won't, but, but, but you knew you were speeding. No. Yeah, we, we need to do something about this. We, we need to do something about this law. No. no yeah, yeah, we sure do. You need to slow down. Yeah, we're back in business. We're back in business. See, we, 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 we challenge. We want to do what we want to do. We want to go back and live as though we're in the days of the judges. And we do what we want. I'm preaching good. But, but, uh, but I'm preaching too long. So let, let, me, let, me, let me speed this up. Paul said, the law, even when I fall beneath the standards, it's good. Now, it is no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me. Here, he's not trying to uh, abdicate uh, his responsibility, uh, the responsibility of his actions. Instead, he's revealed the nature of the inner conflict between the two natures. He says, when I mess up, I have to admit, it's my sin nature that worn out. Still me. Still me now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Still me. But I listened to the wrong part of me. He said, uh, it is no more I but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me. This is, we we got to get there. We got to get there. We, we got to get, we, we get here. We got to get back here. He says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh. Well, you know, I have my own identity. I have my own thoughts. I have my own opinion. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. He says in me, me apart from Christ, that is in me, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. No good thing. Take Jesus out. I'm looking at potential rapists, murderers, thieves, liars, killers, 
whole mongers, you name it, and you're looking at them too. I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. Guided by our flesh. There's no limit to what we are capable of doing. Somebody says so and so is not capable of killing a fly. They wasn't born. They wasn't born. They wasn't old enough because it don't take long for them to become capable. Right. They only kill flies. They pull stuff down, pick up something, throw it, break it, look at it, look at you. Uh, it doesn't take long for that sinful nature to, to develop. develop. People are capable. That's why all of us had to be saved. And you're so sweetly saved now that it looked like you never sinned. Somebody look at you and say, oh, I know you ain't never did that. But you know what? You live with you. And you know what you've done. And you know what you think about doing. You know I'm right. Hallelujah, Jesus. See, we got to get there. We got to get back to that part. See, these psychological preachers have built us up, made us think we're kings and queens and we're more than what we are. No, in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. Do you see that? For, look at this. He says, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Let me help you with that. I find not in my flesh. How to do what God requires, I do not find it in my flesh. Alone, without the help of the Almighty, without the Holy Ghost, without being filled with the Spirit, I do not find the ability to live holy, to live free from sin, to walk upright. It's not in me because in my flesh I crave the things that God have called me out of. Can I get a witness? Uh, get ready, get ready, get out of here uh, for the good that I would. I do not. But the evil that I would not. Look at the battle of the natures uh, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it. He said it again. But sin that dwelleth in me. That is my sin nature one. That's what happened to me. I was saying nature one. That's what happened. Cause I don't cry. I don't know what happened. I know what happened. Sin nature one. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, you were thinking. You, you were thinking. But you were thinking with your sin nature. Mm, well, we're always thinking. But depending on what you think, tells which of the two is winning out at the time. Can I get another witness? Yes, sir. So don't, don't come to a uh, pastor. I don't know what I, I know. And you know. This is why we've got to fight this fight. And, and part of fighting it is to recognize how it works. He said, now, if I, he said, I find then a law, a principle uh, that when I would do good, even, he says, evil is present. It's always a choice. That is, good God Almighty, when I do the right thing, when I want to do the right thing, if my flesh has its way, I still end up a failure and find myself doing the wrong thing. If my flesh has its way. He says, because I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, the inward man here, he's reaching deep in the recesses of his being. Reaching deep, bear with me here, in his soul. It says, even when I'm messing up, there's a part of me. I hate this because this is not me. Even though I'm doing this, it's not me. Because the true me, that inner man, that Born again man 
wants to do what is right because that's the part of me that rejoices in the law of God. It doesn't rejoice in adultery. It doesn't rejoice in fornication. It doesn't rejoice in being jealous or envious or hatred or being a liar or a backbiter. It rejoices in doing holy things. So I got to figure out how to, to yield to that part of me. Praise God. That's that part that'll get you up, clean you up, and get you out of there. Can I get a witness? And so here, I wish I had a praying church. And so he says now, I see another law. Verse 23, I see another law in my humanity. Praise the Lord, warring against the law of my mind. Bringing me into captivity against the law of sin. His mind is the battlefield. Then he gave his last lament. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. He refers to himself here as a wretched man. Speaking of his fallen sinful nature. Good God Almighty, doesn't this fly in the face of the life coaches and the motivational speakers and all of those who teach us to love ourselves? That's part of the problem. Paul says, no, no, I'm a wretched man. That part of me, hallelujah, that flesh is wretched. And then he says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now the question here, two things here. He gives the imagery of a wounded soldier on the battlefield. And the soldier needs somebody to run out, a member of the battalion to run out and pick him up and bring him off of the battlefield. He's out there wounded and he can't help himself. Have you ever been since you've been saved wounded and you couldn't help yourself? Lord, I'm caught up in a funk. I'm caught up in something that I shouldn't be in. I need you to come and deliver me. If you've ever been there, let me see you wave your hand. Oh, Lord. Oh, I got an honest church today. Thank you, Jesus. And then he talked about the body of this death. Now where Paul was born, Paul came up in Tarsus. Right down from Tarsus was a town that had uh, uh, corporal punishment, had capital punishment. And if a man, hallelujah, was found guilty of murdering another man, they would take the body of the murdered man and strap it to the back of the man who murdered him. And that would be his death sentence. Instead of hanging him, instead of crucifying him, instead of stoning him, they wouldn't even hit him. They would just tie the dead corpse of the man he murdered to his body. And his death sentence is, you can live and carry on for as long as you can, but you cannot be separated from this dead body. What a death sentence. What a stench. It would only take two or three days for the murderer to die because as that dead body decayed, the decay seeped into his system and it killed him dead. Paul likened this sinful nature as a dead, rottening, decaying body tied to his back. And he said, oh, who shall deliver me from this dying body? This weight that's tied that always lusts against the things of God. When I want to pray, it says don't pray. When I want to fast, it says don't fast. When I want to shout, it says don't shout. When I want to love my enemy, it says hate your enemy. When I do want to do good to them that despitefully use me, he says no, treat them like they treated you. This thing that's on me, Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the answer came. He said, I thank God. Uh, I thank God. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is, God will do it. God will deliver me. 
The Lord will, through Jesus, let me take you a little further. The Lord will, through Jesus, when Jesus come. When Jesus come. When Jesus come, he's going to separate us from the flesh. When Jesus come, the battle with this thing will be over. When Jesus come, we want to contend with these negative thoughts. We have to contend with these contrasting natures fighting on the inside of us when Jesus comes. So Paul summarizes it and said, since I won't be delivered from this until Jesus comes, he gives a summary and he says, so then with my mind, I'm going to serve the law of God. But if I listen to my flesh, I'll serve the law of sin and it looked like that's the way that it's going to be until Jesus come but I remember I told you that Romans 1 and verse 8 is good news it's good news by itself but remember I told you it's even better news when you put it in its contextual setting all of a sudden the sun begins to rise all of a sudden, the outcome began to change. For I heard Paul said, I know we're going to be separated from this flesh when Jesus comes. But I have some good news. There is. Therefore, now, Jesus hadn't come yet. Now, in this present world, now, in our present state, I need somebody to begin to praise God for what I'm about to tell you. Praise him for the now. Praise him for the now. Ah, now. Ah, now. Grab your neighbor by the hand and use your preaching voice and say, hey. Thank you. This is for the believer. That is therefore now no condemnation, no separation, no condemnatory sentencing to the believer who is in Christ Jesus. How do we beat the devil? How do we beat this man who is strapped to our back? How do we overcome? Here's how there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit he said God has given us the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will give us power to silence the flesh the Holy Ghost gives us power to mortify the deeds of the body the Holy Ghost gives us power to clean up our minds. The Holy Ghost gives us power to tear the flesh. Shut up! To tear the flesh. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God. of the spirit to silence Patrick Wooden and to let Bishop Wooden go on and praise God. Somebody praise him. Woo! Oh, guess what? Guess what? The Holy Ghost, he comes with a law too. He carries a law too. He talked about the principle yes. of the law. Yes. Talked about the principle of sin and death. Yes. But then I heard him say, ah, for the law of the spirit. Of the spirit. See, he walks in. Yes, sir. Holy Ghost said, I got a law too. Mm -hmm. Sin has a law. Moses had a law. Uh -huh. I have a law. 
I have a law. And my law, my law is stronger than the lesser divine law. With Moses, the sentence of death from the Mosaic law is not as powerful as the law of life that comes from the Holy Ghost in Christ Jesus. He gives us power to get free from the penalty of sin and death. Because I already explained to you that men couldn't live up to the law. He says, verse 4 teaches that. He says that the righteousness of the law might be walked out in us. See, we can live this thing. Tell your neighbor, you can live it. You can live it. You can live this thing. Shout, I can do this. I can do this. I can be drinking. I can be lying. I can be midnight rambling. I can meet, be dilly dallying in wickedness because I have the spirit of the Lord. Everybody who has the spirit of the Lord just praise God for the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost gives us power. Woo! He cleanses our thoughts. He cleanses our minds. He cleanses our heart. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Now, but there is a digression. And here's what it is. It's not really a digression, but it is uh, it is the missing piece. It says in verse 5, for they that are after the flesh. Those who live according to the flesh. If the flesh is what you want. See, it boils down to the person. See, I got to bring it down now. If the flesh is what you want, and, and, and wrong, 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 wrong is just what you want. Even if you're born again now, but you, you, you want to you you keep this. I can't get in hell. They that are uh, you, you, uh, fleshly do mind the things of the flesh. See, you can't say that you want to overcome any malady, any spiritual struggle. You can't tell me that you're trying to overcome and, 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 and I ask you, uh, have you fasted right. about it? No. That's good. That's good, Bishop. Are you praying on it? No. Are you studying scriptures that will give you deliverance from it? No. Okay. Are you attending church? Well, you know, when I get caught up in it, I feel so guilty, Pastor. I stay home. No. Are you being intentional about the movies you watch and the music you listen to so that you won't feed that craving? No. Oh, my. Oh, my. No. You are aiding and abetting your flesh. You are helping that which is designed to cause you to self-destruct. You are a willing participant in your own demise. Are you working to keep yourself out of the way of that situation? No. I can't get any help. Praise the Lord. Then that's why you can't overcome it. Why is that? Simple. You don't want to. You mind the things of the flesh. But now, if the answer to all those things are yes, now you're mining the things of the spirit. Well, what, well what's the counsel then if, it's still, uh, if you still uh, feel something and you're going, to, oh, just give it time. It's the snake that you've cut the head off. Body's still doing all that. But you know, I don't even stand there watching it. I mean, the snake's dead. The body hadn't found out yet. Snake's dead. You cut the head off. Still, oh, just squirming, but it's dead. When you mind the things of the spirit, 
when you begin to employ the weapons of our warfare, no matter what craving come up in your flesh, no matter what the flesh says, it's just a matter of time. That thing will die because the weapons of our warfare are more powerful than any weapon, any sin, any craving of the flesh in existence. But you have to use the weapons of our warfare. You can't use the weapons of the world's warfare. Our weapons, prayer, Bible study, fasting, read, uh, reading scriptures on, surrounding yourself with people who are going to encourage you to go in the direction you're trying to go in. A man is messed up if he's an alcoholic and he's married to a wife who is a social drinker, but he's an alcoholic and he's trying to get off of drinking because he's an alcoholic. But she keeps alcohol in the house and they still have their you know, little parties and get together and, 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 and she can hold her stuff. So they still invite people over. He's done. He can't hold it. And he's sitting there trying to come off of it. And every time he inhales, that's all he smells. Everybody's drinking. He'll wake up tomorrow under the table. Not knowing how he got there. Oh, and, and you know what his problem is? His wife. His wife. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, That's right. Amen. Amen. Some of you, your problem is your company. Your company. That's right. Say it, Mr. The good news is the Spirit leads us to victory, but He doesn't. Lead us to victory uh, despite or without our cooperation. We have been given the tools to overcome this wretched man that's tied to us. You don't have to let that decaying body decay you. You don't have to allow the cravings of the flesh to crave and dominate. Next thing you know, you done lost that good job. Lost your good, you had a good wife, ran her off. Had a good husband, he left. Children respected you, they don't know more. Oh my, good income, it's gone. Filled with potential. But you went to school and did everything except that. So that's gone. That's what the flesh wants to do. Versus listening to God. Surrounding yourself with the right people. And listen, I don't care who it is. If they ain't the wrong people, leave them alone. If they're going in a direction that you know you shouldn't be going in, leave them alone. You hear me, young people? It doesn't matter who it is. So, well, because hey, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, people know how to be public angels and private devils. <laughs> when I was at Victoria's Praise the last time, and Pastor Nichols finished preaching about how he stood and would not let same-sex couples come in and sit in in his marriage ministry teaching, which is a no-brainer. He had to fast about that. Well, you know, you can't cl uh, clean them until you catch them. That is a true principle, but it's not comprehensive. There are some areas in life where that thinking doesn't apply. See, and, and, and this is one of them. You can't bring two men in and teach marriage to two men and teach the biblical principles of marriage to two women. And then you got all these other saved married couples sitting up in there. Well, that's going to destroy it. And it's going to destroy everything else too. While he was preaching, 
I noticed some notables dropped their heads and didn't get with him. So I got up and gave a stern rebuke. I meant every word. We were having a jurisdictional function, right. not a local church function. That's right. That's right. That's right. He's the superintendent of the district, but the truth is the bishop is the superintendent of all districts. Oh, right. All superintendents serve at the pleasure of the bishop. That's the way that works. And it hadn't just started working like that. When I made auxiliary bishop, I, I, Bishop Willard, uh, it was his choice That's right. to uh, allow me to remain, to be a superintendent or not. And he chose to allow me to. He could have taken me down from that, or he didn't have. I didn't have to become an auxiliary bishop. He just said, "Superintendent wouldn't stand up. Pastor wouldn't sit down. I'm no longer superintendent. That's the way it works. There's no recourse. We didn't have that kind of problem. We made our stand. Why do I bring it up? When was that? Last fifth Sunday. When was that? Two or three months ago? I know we had coats on. It was, it was still kind of cool. Whenever, a few months ago, whenever it was. But point is, point is, the point is, the point is, someone who was not a member of his church, nor the church that I pastor, came to me and said, I was there that night when you gave that rebuke. Young man said to me, thank you for what you said. He said, because I had begun to go that way and delve into that stuff and that strict word of rebuke brought me out. <laughs> told, me, told me this last week. I had no idea. I hugged him and we rejoiced together in Jesus' name. Well, who was it? A soul set free. And that's all you need to know. A soul set free. That rebuke jolted him and reminded him that he didn't have to listen to the flesh. That he didn't have to go that way. That God had something better for him. And you know what he did? He took it. People, get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need no ticket. But you do need to get on board. Everybody who will take, take it. Will. Preacher, I'm contending with battles in the flesh. I want to get on board. You preach something today. I saw myself, and I want to win this battle with myself. If you are here, and you're in a battle with yourself, and you want to win, get on board by meeting me at the altar. Your battle may be sexual in nature, it may be financial in nature, maybe emotional, whatever it is. I don't know, I don't know, but I know this, people battle with things. 